Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at this very special event. My name's Lisa Smazarski. I'm the editor-in-chief of Stylist magazine. Um, and just before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so please could I ask you to keep your mobile phones off, or switch to silent at least. Um, we're filming today an audio streaming over the web, so welcome to anyone who's watching us online. And a little reminder that we do have a hashtag for today, which is RSA Reclaim Your Lunch Break. So please do get involved in the discussion on Twitter too. Now, firstly, I want to say congratulations to everyone here for taking some time in their day to take their well-earned lunch break and expand their minds a little bit. Um, this is really apt for us today because Stylist Magazine has been running campaigns since January, encouraging our readers to take some time out of their working week and spend it on themselves. And today we are celebrating Reclaim Your Lunch Break Day, which is why we've joined forces with the RSA. And this initiative really is for employers and employees to encourage everyone to help their teams to take time out, to um, encourage their work-life balance and create a healthier working environment. So thank you for coming. But of course, really we're here today to discuss the all-important notion of mission or purpose in business, and we couldn't have a better group of people to do that with. I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to today's speakers. Michael Heyman is co-founder of Seven Hills, the high-growth campaigns firm. It is the Homes Report best corporate consultancy in the world. Which is quite a claim. Um, he's also... <laughs> exactly. I like the title. He's also a co-founder of Startup Britain, the national initiative for early-stage enterprise launched by the Prime Minister, and chairman of entrepreneurs at the private bank Coots & Co. Michael was awarded an MBE for services to entrepreneurship. His co-founder at Seven Hills is Nick Giles. Hi, Nick. Nick worked to develop Tech London Advocates, the campaign to support the, the capital's digital startup community, and is currently leading the effort to transform the UK into a tech nation with Britain's flagship digital campaign, Tech City UK. In 2013, he was appointed ambassador for Invest Hong Kong, tasked with promoting links between London and Hong Kong and positioning the latter as a vibrant hub for global businesses. Nick leads the international communications campaign for One Young World, the global youth charity whose annual summit welcomes speakers including President Bill Clinton and Kofi Annan. So thank you, Nick and Michael, for coming today. Our second speaker today is described as one of the most creative and in influential entrepreneurs of our time, Edwina Dunn. She's best known as co-founder of the international data analytics company at Dunhumby, the business behind the Tesco Club Card. Today, Edwina is CEO of StarCount, a digital startup that measures the global tastes and trends of 1.7 billion people across social networks. She's a passionate campaigner for women and spearheads the What I See project, a not-for-profit initiative to promote the voices and experiences of women from around the world through the medium of film. Edwina is also chair of Your Life, a brilliant government-backed campaign to encourage more young women, especially girls, to consider careers in the STEM industries. So we're going to start today with a short presentation and Michael is going to kick us off. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Oh, there, is there is water there. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much. Um, for having me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a book tart this afternoon. I'm here to sell this excellent book, Mission, How the Best in Business Breakthrough. So I thought to do that, I should get you in the mood. Um, now, I don't know, um, for those of you, when you sit up here, you need the positive energy of the audience. Now, who's ever, who ever has watched golf on television? Have we? Have we uh, okay, great. Do we know what a golf clap is? Let's just, just do a golf clap very, very quickly. Yes, yeah, like that. Yeah. It's the lowest form of emotional engagement. So if we were to go one up, let's try another clap. What would be the second clap up from a golf clap? And what would be the third clap? Oh, yes, excellent, right. Thank you. Well, that's, I'll, I'll take that, I'll bank that. So thank you very much, Lisa, for that introduction. Thank you for having us. Um, we spent the last year um, writing a book, Mission, How the Best in Business Breakthrough. Um, before I get going, I'm going to show you a very short film. Now, this was based on an interview um, that I did in Austin, in Texas, with the um, founder of Whole Foods, John Mackey. Now, 
Um, for anything that you're going to see and hear going forward, we think that John Mackey does, in many respects, exemplify um, the mission spirit. From a startup, a business called Safeway, it was a play on a, on a near neighbor, Safeway, that he wanted to take on. Um, he's created a $14 billion business, uh, valuation uh, business, um, employing 88,000 staff in, in 400 stores. So um, a really successful business. And what's more, Fortune magazine has had it as one of their 18, uh, 100 best places to work for for the last 18 years consecutively. So in terms of the sort of business that we felt was important, this was it. So to sort of get the ball rolling, I'm just going to show you this movie. We've spent the last year looking at the businesses that are making it today. We interviewed leaders from around the world on the relationship between profit and purpose. Conscious capitalism, liberating the heroic spirit of business. It's a clarion cry to entrepreneurs to make a difference. Its author is the millionaire founder of Whole Foods, John Mackey. With a worldwide empire, the Healthy Living Supermarket was founded on the principle that you can be a commercial success without selling your soul. Today, Whole Foods is a beacon for the best in business. Entrepreneurs are fundamentally very creative individuals. They have a sense of higher purpose. They're not in it primarily to make money. That's a secondary concern that comes from. They're, they're fulfilling their dreams and their passions. You've talked about entrepreneurs as the dream creators. You talk a lot about mission um, in, in the book. If you were to set the tone for what these guys should be thinking about in terms of taking this movement to the next stage. What's the next steps? That's a good question. The next step is to, is to create conscious businesses. And nothing succeeds like success. And uh, as we build more conscious businesses, what will end up happening is the ideas will spread and uh, the consciousness will grow and the, the paradigms of business will shift. It'll take a, it'll take a generation, but in 20 years the world's going to be a very different place. There is a vehemence, there is a real sort of sense of almost anger in some of the, some of the pieces you read about your thinking. I was reading uh, a lady in the Huffington Post, she was saying that you're, you know, you're too simplistic, you've got, you know, that the ideas don't stand up to real life scrutiny. Does it worry you that, or, or does that actually sort of, is that kind of proof positive that you're breaking through, that you've got this kind of critic? We wrote the book for the millennials, we wrote it for the younger entrepreneurs. They're the ones that are going to create the conscious businesses that change, that change the world. So what do I care what some journalist thinks somewhere? I don't really care. The last thing my mother said to me before she died was, John, would you please give up this grocery store business and promise me you'll go back to school <laughs> yeah. and, and finish and job. get a degree? And my mother desperately wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor. Life isn't very, sh it's short. It's really so short. You'll, 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 everybody will realize this someday how it just goes by very rapidly. And it's too short to do anything less than follow your heart. It's just, why, why would you settle for anything less than that? The next morning, I met up again with John Mackey, this time at his Whole Foods Global HQ. I'd like to go right back to the start, to the 25-year-old John Mackey that set this up. I mean, give us a sense of what was going through your mind when you started to open the doors of the first store. It just having my own business was exciting. Right. We created something, and it was ours, and uh, we loved it. But there were some dramatic chapters. I mean, tell us about the flood, for example. It was a catastrophe. We were at eight feet of water. Renee actually closed the store up and she swam out the store. Wow. There were all these people helping us clean up the store. I kind of vaguely recognized. Right. Who, who were they? Were well, they friends, were, family, they customers? Were, they were customers and they were neighbors that uh, had heard about what happened to Whole Foods and they came in to lend a hand. And when I later on encountered the term stakeholders and that all stakeholders matter in a business, I mean, I recognized right away that was true. This is, I guess, was the antecedents of conscious capitalism and the idea of being this sort of this idea of the firm of endearment. Absolutely, they, we have we have higher purpose, we have core values, we have a mission, and we're we have the courage to live by that mission and make hard choices at times and. And we're committed to doing right by our customers and, and doing right by all of our stakeholders. So I do think people, if, if you do business with integrity, it takes a while, but people come to see that you have integrity. And we tend to trust people or organizations that we judge are trustworthy, that have integrity, that do what they say, try to be honest, 
Don't try to take advantage of them. How does it feel sort of sitting at the top of that organization today? Do you still recognize everything that you wanted in the business? Are there some things that you still feel you've got to do? I kind of feel like we've barely gotten started. Right. Um, there's major healthcare crisis, not just in the United States, but now increasingly all over the world. Uh, Americans are 69% overweight, 36% obese. It's not the government that's going to solve these problems. It is through our creativity that human beings will solve our problems. So if you, if you think of entrepreneurs, not just in terms of business entrepreneurs, but we need entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs. The way I see it is, is that if, if there's a way to make money at it, business is the right uh, way to approach it. I mean, business, entrepreneurs, competition in the marketplace, essentially capitalism, uh, is the best way to approach many of the challenges and problems we have. John Mackey, thank you very much indeed. Okay, Michael, thank, thank you. you. Mission makes the case for a new and optimistic era for business, that business can and should be a force for good, that purpose gives entrepreneurs the drive to succeed, creating a shared belief that unites teams, stakeholders and customers alike. You can find out more in our book, Mission, How the Best in Business Breakthrough, because I'm going to tell you all about, uh, about this book um, in the next sort of five minutes or so um, and hopefully sort of set the tone for what, what should be a great, great debate. So we wrote this book um, a year ago and we started off um, with the point of view that business should and could be a force for good in society and that actually the reputation of business was so awful um, in so many different ways um, that it didn't actually reflect some of the absolutely great things that were going on on in business, quite often through entrepreneurs that were ripping up the rule book, doing things that were different, and changing society as a result. So we started here, I mean, this is the, the, sub, um, the subhead to um, John Mackey's book, who you heard there, Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business. We felt that there was something heroic in business. Anybody who's been through the startup experience and has grown a business, anybody who's been part of a team that's done that will really get a sense of the heroism of business, that actually, you know, the survival part, that's heroic. Actually going against the odds, one in three businesses don't even make their third birthday. So there is a spirit within business and what we felt was that we wanted to make a contribution to that debate about what it was the business could do. Business we felt was too important to be left on its own. 37 of the world's top 100 economies are corporations. Think about that um, in, in terms of the importance of business and why it needs to move forward in a positive way. And against that backdrop is this tremendous level of change. Last year, only 30 of the original FTSE 100 companies made it to their 30th, uh, made it to the 30th anniversary. So the companies that were big in our parents' generation are no longer big now. The companies that we assumed were the titans that would last forever, in many respects, have gone, have fallen by the wayside. And we live in a world where the most powerful companies um, of our generation are probably yet to be created. They're still walking around. Maybe here in this very room, somebody's got an idea for a startup that is going to become one of the great hopes um, for business of the future. And that's why mission matters, because mission gives people, it gives organizations and teams the purpose to make a difference, the purpose to succeed, the purpose to win. And we came up in the book, we interviewed 35 entrepreneurs with effectively an equation about what made successful businesses seem to break through. The first part of that was what you heard in the video, mission, the fact that their purpose, a driving purpose really matters. But if all it is is words, if all it is is a mission statement um, in, a, uh, in, a, in a company's business plan, then it really does fail the point that actually you have to get out there and do something with it. And a lot of these characters that you meet in terms of modern successful firms, they are campaigners. They are people that are absolutely <coughs> active in their ability to get out there. And they get something which we talk about being the Cinderella asset, momentum, that ability to make an impact, that movement in business that really does define the greats from the good, those great businesses that you actually look at and see them as being successful. And that's partially because of this picture, that the world is changing massively. So if we'd gone back just 10 years, we could have shown you this picture. Um, a titan of the internet era, AOL, valued at $20 billion. 
Um, a business that, you know, who doesn't remember going to Blockbuster Video? Oh, what a difference. Don't you remember it? I mean, we all went there. All of us that bought a Blockbuster Video, valued at $8 billion. This little tiny shrimp called Facebook that had just raised $12.7 million of capital. YouTube founded. Uber, still a thousand days away in the minds of its founders. Think about that world, which is only 10 years ago. Now look at the world that we have today. A Titan reduced, acquired for $4.4 billion. Blockbuster Video, defunct. Facebook, valued at $230 billion. YouTube at 70, Uber at $50 billion. This is the world of explosive growth and explosive change. And it's a world that's creating new establishments. 10 years ago, who would have thought that a business that was yet to be created and will be a digital platform only will be the home of Nobel laureates, of Pulitzer Prize writers. And that, of course, is the story of BuzzFeed. 150 million monthly unique visitors as compared to 57 million for the New York Times and 31 million for the Wall Street Journals. New establishment being created. Now, now this is my dog. She's not the new establishment. Um, she's called Dora. She's a particularly lovely Welsh Terrier. But I brought her here today to make a point to you, which is that we're living in an era of dog years where every new year is worth seven old ones. So if you're thinking about, I might start my business up next year, I'm just going to give myself a year, you're basically saying, I'm going to take nearly a decade in old money in terms of ta in taking the time to change. This is the context about why mission matters now more than anything else. It's because we've come out of a post-recessionary world, and it's a recessionary world that is speeding up exponentially every year that we go forward. That's what it means to be explosive growth. 760,000 new businesses created in the last five years. And in many respects, we, we wrote this book for those businesses, the businesses that didn't have the playbook of what it means to be successful in a post-recessionary world. Um, at the other end of those startups come these unicorn businesses, the, the billion-dollar startups, um, increasing by 133% since January 2014 alone, 42 to 98. And many of those are here in Britain and in Europe. This is a part of the world that does very well with that sort of business. And two-thirds of the companies that are going to make up the S&P 500, the register of the world's most successful businesses, two-thirds of those companies in 10 years, they estimate don't even exist yet. So think about that in terms of the level of change, is that those successful companies are being founded right now. And we live in that generation where these explosive business firms are being created. And even when you look at um, the S&P 500 today, 80% of the value of its members is in, intangible. Now, a lot of that is IP, but a lot of it is now reputation, brand, trust, identity. These things that actually drive accountants mad because how do you put a value on something that you can't measure in that way? Technology has empowered these companies, but it's also empowered consumers. Consumers want a completely different relationship with business than they had. We live in a radically transparent age where Twitter can reduce very arrogant companies in a matter of moments in terms of the dialogue um, that's, that, that, that they can have through social media. Um, consumers aren't prisoners. I mean, this is the point. Um, staff aren't prisoners. Employees aren't prisoners. All of your stakeholders aren't prisoners. They're there to be liberated, and technology is doing that. And it means something that's desperately important for business. According to the Havas Meaningful Brands Index, um, consumers wouldn't care less if 74% of the world's brands drop dead tomorrow. 74%. You really don't want to be on the side of that equation, which is the 74%. You want to be learning from those brands that survive, those brands that break through. And the millennials, the rise of the millennials is so important in this debate. By 2025, they're going to represent 75% of the world's workforce the most opinionated value judgment set of, of consumers that's ever lived will be the establishment in terms of the working world. And in today's information-rich um, and attention-poor world, it's very hard to break through because of the clutter of information that actually people are facing in their daily lives. So in that world, companies need to connect with their customers. And the argument we make in the book is that quite often people will say, well, you know, you can have profit or purpose. Well, actually, what we make the case for is that purpose is the best route to profit, is that those businesses that have clearly defined purposes stand out 
They're differentiated from a lot of their competitors. And because of that, they are successful. Because this is an age made for activists. And we talk about the rise of the era of the activist business. Now, some of those businesses have got very social purposes. We, we look at businesses like Patagonia that look at the sustainability of clothing, that want to change the world in very, in very, in very good ways. But other businesses... Um, have less socially defined um, sets of purpose. Businesses like Uber, businesses like Amazon, and we look at those too. Jeff Bezos was the founder of Amazon. He said, I strongly believe that missionaries make better products. Missionaries. Businesses and people with a sense of mission. When he started Amazon, he registered a URL called relentless.com. If you get a chance, go on to relentless.com, see where it takes you, because it takes you to a very close place to his business. When he, when he registered his business, when he created his business, he, he created a computer program, which meant that every time an Amazon product shipped, a bell would ring to celebrate that moment, that great moment in the business history. Now they do 306 products a second that are shipped. The bell's been retired. Um, you know, these, these, um, these entrepreneurs are not just about American entrepreneurs, US entrepreneurs. Look at the UK, look at the rising group of entrepreneurs that are doing so many different things. Rohan Silva, he's got a great business called Second Home. Um, and this idea that actually entrepreneurs that want to change the world, guess what, if they can vision that, they do that. Now, the thing that's different is that in a social setting in the UK, um, I think we get intensely comfortable, uh, uh, uncomfortable, excuse me, when, it, when in sort of circles of Brits we talk about wanting to change the world. Well, <clears throat> believe it or not, that is increasingly the culture that I think British entrepreneurs are exemplified by, which is that they can play a big part in the way that we're going to live our world. These purpose-driven companies achieving social ends, goals that are about life through the metaphor of business. Paul Lindley from Ellis Kitchen being a really good example of that. Bigger companies like TalkTalk, Talk, Dido Harding made the point to us that when she became CEO, people would say they worked anywhere but TalkTalk Talk in terms of her team. It was the creation of purpose, the deriving of purpose into the DNA of the business that changed all of that. And part of that, we think, is about the maintenance of that startup culture. Startups are like children. They see things in a vivid way. They taste things differently. And we believe that that vivid nature is an important part of what keeps businesses hungry, what keeps them focused, what keeps them remembering what they went into business in the first place for. We identify three types of company sector in the book, the carers, the sharers, and the darers deeply transformational groups of businesses, deeply tribal in their ability to sort of grow. The carers, um, Whole Foods is a very good example of that. Ellis Kitchen is another one closer to home or decoded um, just over down the road in Shoreditch. I mean, these are businesses that want to improve you and nurture you, and they're not without their critics. Whole Foods is criticised as being whole paycheck in, in the States, but they nevertheless are driven by this sense of the improvement of the soul and the body, good in every sense. Whole foods, whole people, whole planet, digital enlightenment, looking at big social issues that they can take a grip of and actually use their businesses to actually create solutions for. The sharers, Airbnb being perhaps the world's most successful example of the sharing economy, blah, blah, cars from France, um, or freecycle.org, but look at the language, belong anywhere, share your journey, changing the world one gift at a time. The fact that actually we can use our own assets, our own economic assets, and create wealth from them, nothing could uh, exemplify that more than a bed. Now, we interviewed Joe Gebbia. Um, he doesn't normally dress like that, I can tell you. He's normally like a very cool surfer dude from San Francisco, but we couldn't find any royalty-free images of him that uh, did him justice. But actually, what he said here was that our brand is not about accommodation, it's about belonging. Think about your own relationship with Airbnb the next time in terms of an understanding of why you connect. That has been the mission. Um, the, the Airbnb story is a wonderful story um, that perhaps we could talk about um, a little bit in, in, in the interview, but um, the bottom line about that business is that this is the accidental entrepreneur that rented out his airbed and created a, a fabulous global business as a result of that. And of course the darers, the businesses that want to use technology to change and drive things in a way which we might never have dreamt of. Hampton Creek, really good business, um, interesting business, trying to sort of use technology so that actually junk, health, junk food can become healthy. Could technology do that? Or the strong cheese over here. You either love them or loathe them. Transport for all as reliable as running water. Well, I'd try you. Um, I, who didn't use Uber yesterday? I mean, actually, this idea that they're going to change business. Now, there's nothing that feels very soft about Uber's um, mission statement. In many respects, their sort of their view of 
black cabs in London is a bit akin to sort of cars and horse and traps a century ago. But nevertheless, what's interesting about somebody like Travis Kalanick is that when he talks about Uber, he says this, we're running a political campaign and the candidate is Uber. And what does a political company do? Remove a million cars from the streets of London. I mean, that's the plan of Uber. That's its stated ambition in terms of this market. So we identified what we've called the new character um, in terms of these sorts of mission-based, mission based mission um, driven companies, drive the refusal to give in, self-improvement, never stopping learning, communication, the ability to get the message across, disruption, always going against the grain, always doing something new, the ability to persuade and connect in terms of making the case and building the network. But perhaps most importantly of all of those is this issue of optimism. They are unbelievable optimists, the people that we, that we interviewed in the book, in terms of their ability that actually their business would succeed in the long run. And whereas society can often sort of as, say this business has failed, this entrepreneur has failed, I don't think under their own terms that many of the people that we interviewed ever would accept that definition. They'll only accept success and failure under their own terms. These are some of the issues that are behind that equation. And just to finish off, I just sort of throw out some, some other ideas that we picked up in the books. Simplicity matters. Um, Marjorie Scardino um, was a very well-known chief executive of Pearson just around the corner um, from here. And she talked about that simpler things cut through. That's important to Mission. When she took over Pearson, they had such a ragtag of assets. She even found an avocado farm somewhere in the, in the group of business. It's true. Um, but it actually, you know, it's a very different proposition when you want to be the world's learning company as compared to just being a conglomerate of lots of different things. At the same time, Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, an excellent entrepreneur, he's got a business called The Black Farmer. He said that every great change has come from challenging the status quo. A lot of mission-based businesses know what it is that they want to change. And then he always, he always said as well in, in the interviews that you know, every great start, story starts with jeopardy. It's got to be something worth doing, worth getting out of bed in the morning to do, something that it is you want to change. And Seth Godin, he said, ideas like viruses, they need sneezers to spread the message. Well, we are living in a generation where ideas really do matter as far as businesses are concerned. But you need the tribe of people to get out there to tell your story, to be the super advocates, whether it's on social media, whether it's in your team, or whether it's in your marketing. And Mark McCormack, he was the inspiration behind Jerry Maguire. Remember, show me the money. He said that all things being equal, people will buy from a friend. All things being not quite so equal, people will still buy from a friend. This is a world where friendship really matters. Mackie talks about letting love out of the corporate closet. I mean, he's not wrong in that, that actually there should be something emotional. There is something that is really inspiring about the brands that break through. A mission is something that gives it to them. So I'll just finish here, Lisa, is that um, I, I do want to give you a reason as to why you should read this book. And I thought I'd end on the words of PJ O'Rourke. <clears throat> and he said this, he said... Um, Always read something that will make you look good if you die in the middle of it. I guarantee you, you will look great if you read Mission. Thank you very much. That's <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Um, a brilliant insight um, into not only the book, but the world at large, which lots of discussion points. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Edwina. <clears throat> Just going to balance that there. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, and um, I thought I'd share with you the reason that um, I wanted to speak today and to speak um, very positively on behalf of Michael and Nick. Um, I am an entrepreneur. I have been in a business... Um, for a very, very long time. I grew a business. Today, it's being sold for around £2 billion, which is really, really exciting, given that it started on my kitchen table. Um, and I'm really proud of that. I don't own it anymore, but I'm proud that that's what it's become. Um, I would never, ever have thought it. And it's incredibly exciting that all through those incredibly tough years where everybody went, Dunhumby who? What a strange name. What is it you do, really? Why would that make a difference? To it suddenly being something that, you know, people get. People now get data's important, data's strategic. They used to laugh at me when I said 
data was strategic. They went, of course it isn't. It's tactical. It's direct marketing. Some of you might remember that. So there are a lot of years where, as Michael said, no one believes you, no one supports you, no one encourages you. The reason Nick and Michael are important is, number one, they get how strange entrepreneurs are, how optimistic, furiously, ridiculously optimistic, how they fall over and bounce, they get up again, they get up again, they get knocked, they get up again, they try a different way. And that is something that's a very stubborn streak in entrepreneurs, and I think they understand it very well. And the second reason that's really important is that they are too incredibly encouraging and positive. And that's not easy. You know, when you're talking about your new business and you're trying to find a way of explaining it, you know, bringing to the fore all the good strands, all the big strands, is incredibly important. Because when you're really close to something and it's your business, you talk about it in very strange, geeky ways. And it has to be translated for the real people out there who need to understand it and get it. And so that's a, an important dynamic. And, you know, when I, when I finished, I just want to make two more points. There's also one other characteristic that we have in common is that Michael and Nick work together incredibly well. They're opposites but very complimentary. And um, I should really be standing here today with Clive Humby, who I'm not only married to, but has been my partner in business for 30 years. And people are always astonished that we're still married and talking to each other. <laughs> but somehow it survives. And I think it's because we both have the same mission and purpose, and it's lived with us, even through having a family, even through the years of Dunhumby selling it and then back in the groove with Star Count, which is just as exciting. Um, and, and so, you know, it is about the two of us doing it. And we are yin and yang. We are complete opposites. If any of you know us, you know, Clive is the logical mathematician scientist. He's the creative R&D. And I'm the business person. And I put the teams together and worry about how we're going to get the product out of the door. And, and that's kind of how it works. The two observations that I want to make is really that... Um, Businesses actually, I think, you know, entrepreneurs or businesses, to be successful, to be ready for the future, businesses must do what they need to do. And I know that sounds really obvious, but businesses don't do what they need to do always. They do what they've done in the past because they're perfectly designed to do what they used to do. And when the world changes and we have these fast dog years that are upon us, we actually struggle with this resistance of, well, we've always done it like that. That's the way we do it. So what's this new thing that you're talking about? It's uncomfortable. It's strange. Why should I do that? So resistance, transformation, and change is hard and painful. But the faster the years go, the more businesses have to to adapt and adapt fast. So my purpose and the thing I've always been on is really to help to, to understand and to help other businesses understand who customers are, what they want, and to know them better than anybody else. If you know customers or consumers better than anyone else, your business works better and faster. So that's the mission what we did 20 years ago with Tesco and then Kroger and Clubcard isn't good enough now. We have to do new stuff because the world's changed and everything's got faster. So that's my purpose. That's what drives me. You know, I can't sit here saying, well, I used to be good at that, so it's okay. I have to say, I used to be good at it, and now I have to learn lots of new things and be better. And I think... That's what businesses have to do. We used to do it like that. It used to be okay. Now we have to do it differently and better. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Edwina. Well, um, I just wanted to, actually, I just wanted to ask the audience a question before we got started, which was how many people have their own business in this room? So we're pretty well represented. And of those, how many would think they have a mission at the heart of their business? Okay, good. Okay, I just wanted to gauge where we were. Um, because one of the things that um, occurred to me when you were talking um, was that how many of the old businesses don't have this mission and how if you already have a business you can transform your business have a mission. You mentioned Pearson and Talk Talk, Michael, as a specific example. Um, can you change a business to give it a heart or give it a sense of mission yeah. and does that feel true? Well, I think it's part of the new cost of doing business, which is that, you know, modern in these days, employees don't want to feel bad about who they work for. I doubt even business leaders, in many respects, want to. Um, but it's how quickly businesses are getting hold of this. I think there are some very big businesses that are doing some special things. I mean, um, I'd point to somebody like Paul Pullman at Unilever, who, mm -hmm. has, who has really sort of gone against the grain. But whether he can create a you know, a mission for Domestos, I mean, you know, on behalf of the 99.9% of germs, I don't know, but I mean, there is a, the, uh, but, uh, but I think that um, what is without question is that a sense of mission and purpose is easier to um, hardwire into the DNA of a startup than it is to graft on to a business that is sort of 20 or 30 years old. Mm. And I think that in many respects, um, where a lot of large corporations get this wrong is they see this as something which is about CSR and philanthropy rather than actually mm. being mission critical to actually building successful businesses for the future. And that's the knowledge gap that has to be closed. But we do look at some big businesses where, where that change was clear. I mean, the, the other one that we looked at in the book was uh, Marks and Spencer's mm. were under Stuart Rose, yes. where um, he read An Inconvenient Truth um, on one plane trip. And, he, and it's funny how these things happen, right? He bought this book because it had lots of pictures in it and he was tired <laughs> and he didn't want to read very much. But actually, on the course of a relatively short plane trip, he, he, woke, you know, he thought, this is, this is amazing, and he created Plan A, which was all about, because there is no Plan B, mm. um, that Plan A was all about turning Marks and Spencers into a sustainable business. Now, whatever you think about Marks and Spencers, whatever you think about um, a lot of things about the business, is that, that plan, Plan A, has been hugely important in creating a new mission for Marks and Spencers as a very old business. And, and similarly, is it possible to, um, I mean, where, where does this, where do the, the business ideas come from? We talked a little bit about ideas in the sense that you have to have a good idea to get out there. But for the aspiring entrepreneur who's looking at this space, is it a case of saying, I have a mission, now I build a business? Or is it, I'd like to be a business owner, how do I get a mission into it? Um, I'm Nick, sorry, go for that, yes. Um, I think a great example in the book is another entrepreneur that we work very closely with, Paul Lindley of Ellis Kitchen. It's a business that's gone from nothing, another idea that the founder had to number one in its market, number one baby food brand in the UK. And, and Paul had never worked in the food business. Paul was a television executive on the finance and accounting side at Nickelodeon. But he also had a young family, a daughter who was starting to refuse to eat fruit and vegetables. And he wondered how, as a father of a young daughter, do I put my practical professional experience to bear to address this? And he actually came up with the idea of Ella's Kitchen before he'd actually figured out precisely what the products were going to be. And this was all about engaging with kids in a fun and entertaining way, not presenting baby food in as glooping glass jars with screw top lids, but actually colourful, fun looking squeezy packages that were full of nutrient rich baby food and and that business has gone gangbusters mm -hmm. from an idea that he and his wife kicked off to something that he was pitching to Sainsbury's they were the very first company to stock them to number one in 20 30 countries with a turnover in excess of 100 million a year um, and I think Paul's a a great entrepreneur he built a great brand and a great business but I believe he, he exemplifies a lot of the traits that Michael talked about. There was a driving sense of purpose. This wasn't simply, can I create a brand that will shift? This was, can I create a business that could radically transform our children's relationship with food? Can we get kids more interested in eating well by having this experience at an early age? 
and now he's a frontline campaigner on nutrition, the UK's um, diet-related disease issues, obesity, diabetes, and, and I think absolutely is exemplifying that activist mentality mm. which frankly he doesn't need to do no. but he does because it's a it's a burning passion within him that has helped him build the business to what it is and presumably that has a halo effect around the brands because it's so earnest and true i mean why why do we think the millennials are having this desire for authenticity and heart at the big at the middle of their brands i mean edwina i don't know if you've got any thoughts well, I think um, social media has changed a lot, and I think people now um, turn to the authentic activists on social media, the people who are creating content or amplifying it, and they're getting reference from those people. So we, we all know examples of where, you know, we try and get a... a um, blogger or vlogger to actually sponsor a brand or mm. sponsor a product and it sits really uncomfortably yeah. so unless it's authentic the fans of that blogger disappear because it's like you've turned tail so there's You're nowhere no to longer. hide essentially there's nowhere there? to hide it has to be aligned with mm. reality but i think on, on top of that as well is that it even though we live in an era where it's harder to trust. It, it does, it's not the same thing we don't want to believe. And I think yeah. that, you know, the thing about millennials is that they have turned their back on kind of, you know, many of the sort of traditional roots of authority. And of course, very large companies are quite often that. I mean, if you, if you were to sort of um, put a companion piece to that 2010 and 2015 slide, I mean, mm. even going back as five years ago, you might well have seen that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of sort of younger people would have wanted to work in very different organizations than they want to work in mm -hmm. today. And I think this is why the rise of the startup culture has been so brilliant for Britain. I mean, we, we've observed that, all three of us. Um, and, you know, the Startup Britain campaign saw it around the country. It's not just in London. It's every city and, and town around the country where actually this sort of ability to follow your passions, follow your heart, becomes a really sort of realisable way of actually building a business. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to take some questions from the floor because I'm sure there are many. Um, if you would like to... Who'd like to... Lady there, please. Thank you. There's one coming towards you right now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was terrific. Um, we also live in a world where we have services from the public sector, and I just wonder what lessons there are for the NHS. You know, squillion uh, business uh, with uh, that's very bureau—I can't say the word—so top-heavy with bureaucracy because of past mistakes. How would you take some of what you've learnt into that huge business? New job, wow! <laughs> Who'd like to? <laughs> Edwina, would you um, like to? Well, on the plus answer? side, on the plus side, there is the most enormous opportunity to understand what people want from the data that exists across the NHS. Mm. And the other plus news is that technology has never been cheaper, bringing data together has never been easier, and frankly, there have never been more data scientists in the world as now. So that opportunity is absolutely there. Um, I think there are still some old controls around how government and big business buy future enlightenment platforms. I think there's still a lot of processes that say you have to be a very, very big established business to be a supplier to government. And actually, that sometimes makes it very difficult, the whole approach tendering process to explore new capabilities, new concepts. And so I think sometimes if you want, you know, a new radical of the moment, of the time response. You have to sort of slightly let go of some of the restrictions that were designed 10, 20 years ago. These are legal restrictions from the last year, you know, following the Francis report. You know, when those people died in mid Staffordshire. So I'm really looking for something that will help us. I think, I mean, my... my <laughs> yeah, no, no, but my, but my view is we need to understand what, what, what issues, what problems, what 
what the evidence is around people right across the NHS. We need, instead of having lots and lots of little silos of information and data, you know, we need to bring together a vision of what, you know, our citizens, our, our, our people um, want from us. And if we can't do that, um, it's going to be quite difficult to, to, to have a business that's ready um, for the right demand. If, if, there's a, if there's a lesson from business, I think it's that it is very, very hard for very large, large groups of people to have the same sense of mission and purpose that smaller groups have. And that is one of the biggest problems that bureaucracies face, which is that the forward dynamic of business right now is about smaller teams, not bigger teams. And I think that one of the big questions, I mean, actually, Matthew Taylor from here from the RSA, I mean, he he made a very interesting point um, at a conference we ran earlier this year, which is that the biggest opportunity for the state is to think about this sort of devolution proposal in terms of actually creating smaller pools of, of decisions, so cities and towns. And what you see, around, you know, when we, when we wrote the book was that there are certain cities that just seem to have something. There's an X factor. So we went to Austin and we went to San Francisco and we found something special in those places. I mean, the thing they, one of the people we spoke to said about Austin is he said, if you go to LA, he said, um, every Uber driver tells you they want to be an actor or an actress. He said, in, in Austin, everybody gives you a business plan because actually they want to, you know, they want to, they want to grow a business. Yeah. And there is something about that culture which is above and beyond the individual business, but it is about society and about how you create mission within it. And on, uh, as a side point, actually, a question that occurred to me is that um, you referenced John Mackey as saying all employees are stakeholders, but how do you galvanise teams? How do you galvanise your employees to spread your word, to spread your mission? Are there good techniques that you've come across, Nick? I don't know. Well, I think it comes back to that central point that the, is the mission true? Is it authentic? Can people believe you as the founder or founding team? And do they buy into it? Do they want to share that journey? And I think if, if you have that strong sense of purpose hardwired into the business, then, then it is able to scale. Well, I think what we observe in London, I'd be very interested to speak to some of the people here afterwards about the, the firms they're in, but what we've seen is a massive proliferation of new companies in the UK in the last few years. Many of them are scaling very, very quickly. Um, you know, there's often a complaint that, the, that London or the UK isn't creating the mega businesses that, that Silicon Valley can, but what we absolutely see are companies that are going from 30 people to 300 people very, very rapidly. So that, they're very quick changes in the demographic or the, the, the makeup of a yeah. business, the challenges of, of, of scaling a team and building a culture. But what we see is, is a strong sense of a purpose, a mission, and that they're, they're all clear on what that is, top, and clarity yeah. from the top. But it's an exhausting world in many respects. I mean, you know, increasingly it's the demands of, of um, customers and people alike that the relationship with the brand is that it's always on. So if you work in that environment and you don't have a mission, you don't have a binding mm. sense that sort of unites people, how can you expect to win out? And just to pick up on that yeah. point again, I think that Airbnb for us is such a, a great emblem of what we're talking about in the book. And we, we had a fantastic opportunity to speak with Joe Gebbia. I mean, these, these guys, Joe and Brian Chesky, are still in their 20s, if, if, if you know, maybe just hit 30. They, they stumbled on this idea to make rent. This was a, you know, a question of how do we scrape together twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 to, to pay for that apartment. And so they came up with the idea of the airbed, but in a very short period of time, they're, they're articulating this clear sense of belonging. He says there, well, this isn't about accommodation, this isn't about disrupting Hyatt and Hilton, this is about a, an idea that we can all buy into. What will it feel like when I visit that city for the first time? Rather than go to an anonymous hotel room, I, I have a different sense. And I think that speaks to the community of people that want to work for Airbnb. And there was a brilliant, I'll urge you to look it up, there's a brilliant example from earlier this year of a millennial young girl um, desperate to work for Airbnb and she'd been hammering on the door everywhere that she could. But she ended up presenting online um, essentially a strategy plan for Airbnb to establish itself in the Middle East analysis of each of the city opportunities etc etc and it was so fantastic and she was so canny in how she did it 
that she directed it straight to Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia, so they got to see it, and it, it may have been withheld from them for, for months and months, if not forever, but because it got straight to them, she got the opportunity, got the job, and I think if you can instill that burning sense of passion in people that work for you, want to work for you, then you've got a supercharged brand that can, can do enormous things. Absolutely. Right. Uh, lady here. Thank you. Hello. Um, it's been such an interesting... Um, I'm not from a business background. I work for a charity called International Medical Corps. One of our nurses was actually featured in Stylist a few weeks ago, one of our Ebola nurses. Um, with so much mission now in business, where does that leave us in the charity sector? And how would you suggest we work with business so that we can deliver uh, for the thousands of people who really rely on charity uh, as well as business to make a big impact in the world? That's a good question. I don't know. No, Michael, do you want to...? Well, I think, I think the answer is, is that um, it's working in cooperation. I mean, I think that um, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we looked at are looking at some of the big social problems and, and, and health is no exception actually and um, what we know is that what makes a lot of these businesses powerful is the profit motive is that they want to build businesses out of it that actually they are commercial entities um, and I think that's part of what makes them special because they throw so much energy at it and I think that um, in many respects, the, the, the role of, uh, I think, of charity has been looking in that way very, very, very much like that over the last couple of years, last, certainly since the, um, since the recession started, is that charities have become much more commercial in orientation. Um, but I think um, in, in many respects that, that is the sort of the journey of travel. And I'm not sure there's a specific answer of what the charitable sector has to do. Apart from make room, I would suggest, for people that want to make a difference. I mean, I have one um, area that might be relevant as, as experience. Um, so, you know, w what I've found is obviously I've been very focused commercially, but in that journey, um, grown some passions for a, for a few things, science, education, and, and helping women have a stronger voice. And those things have led me to try and get support from the commercial sector for those purposes. And I have found actually businesses to be incredibly responsive. If you can explain how your purpose, which is not for profit or, or charitable, um, helps them with something that matters enormously to them and helps their business enormously, um, the funds are there, you know. Uh, I'm chair of something called Your Life, which basically promotes the sciences to 14 to 16 year old. It's basically do more maths and physics because it's going to help you in the future. It's going to help you um, in any job that you choose. And actually, you know, we got 11 businesses. We raised three million pounds in four months from entirely commercial enterprises because they are dying from lack of talent, from, from um, science-orientated young people. So I think it's about aligning interests, and I think businesses are thinking about a higher purpose. Charities do enormously good work. If the two can be kind of aligned, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Thank you. A question from this side. I saw a few hands go up before. Is there someone over here? <laughs> you've gone, you've gone. Let's move on. We'll come to this gentleman over here, please. Thank you. Is it a help or a hindrance to an aspiring entrepreneur to take a business degree, an MBA, uh, and follow that path? Or is it better just, in light of what you've been saying, to go with their gut feeling and, and their passion? Nick, what's your thoughts? Well, certainly wouldn't say you don't get an education, but um, we have had the good fortune to spend some time working with Richard Branson and, and, and looking at, at how he's built his empire. And his motto was always, screw it, let's do it. So I think there is an element to entrepreneurship, which is get on with the idea. And, and I think to Michael's point about 
dog years and the pace of change. I think if you've got a great idea now, uh, that's not to say it's still going to be a great idea if you don't get on with it um, and you wait wait several years. So um, I think there are great schools out there. We work with with a number of them that are absolutely focused on on um, teaching entrepreneurship and, and running very effective courses to help people think about how they would run their own organisation. But um, I do think there's an element of um, just get on with it. <laughs> Thanks, fair, fair response. Another question from here. Lady in the green shirt, thank you. Yes, is it green? Sorry. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you so much for so, so, uh, such inspiring words. I mean, I'm very interested in the examples that have been chosen because they're either established businesses who've, who've made the shift um, or they're sort of what started as quite lean and hungry startups. And I'm wondering what the panel um, think that um, needs to be done to encourage lots of other businesses um, to become more uh, mission or value driven given that they might look and say, well, actually, that's a luxury that I can't afford. Mm. You know, I'm so concerned with my bottom line right now. You know, um, can, I, can I take the risk that my customers won't come with me? Um, so, Michael. I, I, I think, almost going back to the video, is that I think a lot of what we're talking about within half a decade to a decade's time is going to be the status quo, is that actually businesses that just stand for doing bad things. I mean, I think, you know, we're already at a point where, you know, brands we don't like pay a heavy price. Um, I think that increasingly this is going to be the cost of doing business, is that we want to know that the brands that we shop with, the brands that employ us, the brands that we grow with, is that they stand for things which are about a better version of the world. And, and whereas that won't mean that in 10 years' time you won't have businesses that, that, that don't plow on regardless because they mine things or they do things which are so far back. Nevertheless, the whole of the value chain of business will mean that increasingly we want to work with and we want to commission organisations that stand for the very best of things, not the very worst. Yeah, you a deck I, of that, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I was always... You know, when I, when I was thinking about what was important in a business, I was always um, encouraged to think about anything I did being published on the front page of the Times or the Mail or any, sorry, <laughs> or any um, <laughs> newspaper. Yeah, yeah. Stylist. Yeah, yeah. And, and I critique think, of business is second to none. <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, um, I think you have to always imagine that everything you do, everything you stand for, is on that front page of the newspaper. And I think in a market, in a world, where people more directly judge and comment, yes. um, that's going to become increasingly important because we have to stand by not just what our company does, but what we do in that company. So, so that immediacy, that accountability, in volume, at scale, across the globe is here and I think that's the question we need to ask ourselves so I don't think it's easy but but I think we have to feel it and I think what will happen is people will choose businesses that align with their values and beliefs and that will be the significant change when we first were doing the synopsis for this I always remember <clears throat> this guy who we interviewed was was um, talking about how you know, this idea of almost like the new religion is that people want to believe in things and that actually business is fulfilling a or certain types of business fulfills a void so when you see certain teams of people being absolutely driven about the building of those goals 10 years ago you'd have said well they've all got equity you know they've all got a shared interest now there's something which is it's more spiritual than that, in some respects. The connection that people have with certain types of businesses, that they want them to do well, they want them to grow well. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's where the special nature of the, of the businesses of the future will be, which is that there is an emotional connection mm -hmm. with people um, in a very different way than we've been taught is the, um, is, is, is the way that business should behave. <clears throat> and I think that 
there is this more emotional side to, to running businesses, which is, which is becoming ever more apparent. And that actually, when you see a lot of those businesses, is that actually wanting to change the world is not a passive ambition. It means that you want to do something really active. And I think that how we prepare people for that world, which is so fast changing, is really important. And this goes back to your question at the beginning, which is how does education prepare them for it as well? So I think there are many things that will change over the course of the next 10 years that will create a very, very different environment for business as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, this lady on the end here, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, is there such a thing as a bad mission <laughs> driven business? Last week we had Manzini, one of the examples he gave was Uber mm -hmm. and how it subverted something that was good and being done in social enterprise spirit and now is quite evil. <laughs> Who would like to tackle uh, that? Nick, how about you? <laughs> um, I guess, yes, I guess there can be a bad mission, but I think the, the businesses that we focused on are those that are setting out with a positive outlook and a, a sense of what, what they can do to improve things. Um, I think it's important to say that the book is not solely about um, businesses that are, are setting out to affect social change. This is also the sense of driving mission and purpose that propels those businesses forward, that uh, you know, encourages them and their stakeholders, their, their communities, their employees, their customers um, to stick with them and continue with them. And I think that, that's an important point I wouldn't want to um, gloss over. It's what drives that business on over time, what continues to um, um, forge it forward. I mean, we, put, I mean we, we looked at Uber and Amazon for very specific reasons to address this point, right, which is that um, in the end we've not tried to make a judgment call about good and bad missions. What we have said is that actually businesses with mission tend to succeed and that there are an awful lot of businesses that just seem to be rudderless and without mission and therefore don't succeed in the same way. So in terms of this world where technology is post-recessionary, there are different factors at play, we believe those are part of the characteristics of those successful firms. And ultimately time will, will tell actually about whether they were good or bad missions because if what Uber has done is opened up a whole new generation of a relationship between people and travel, then we might not sort of spend that much time remembering how they got there. But we will say that it was mission completed. I think we all know a, a very small number of people who achieve great things but not in the right way. Mm -hmm. And I think we probably all form an opinion of how offensive that is. Um, and and I, I, I think that's one to think about. You know, there's, there's, there's getting the result but in the wrong way mm -hmm. and and how how sustainable is that and how sustainable is it in the new world uh, it, much, yeah. it's a thought um, keen to end on a high however <laughs> um, as we're mission. about to wrap it's up <laughs> it's <the sequel>. yeah, <laughs> if you, yeah if you did have each of you one piece of advice to um, somebody ready to start or starting a process of a mission-inspired business, what would your advice be, Nick? Well, I think it picks up on this point here about should you go to school, should you get on with it. I think what we're hugely encouraged by is the, the number that Michael talked about, the 760,000 net new businesses created in the UK. I think we're, this, we're seeing a radical reshaping of the business landscape in this country, much more entrepreneurial, much more independent. And I think that the that the fact that so many hands went up when Lisa asked how many people are running their own business, I find hugely encouraging. And I think what we've observed over the last few years is a high proportion of businesses that have a very, very strong sense of what they are setting out to do and why are the ones that are charging forward. So I don't think it's something to be done on a whim. I don't think it's something to be done willy-nilly because back to the earlier point, there is a heroic aspect to getting your business up and running and through those first few years. So I think having a, a very clear sense of what you're seeking to do and, and why you're going to do it um, is fundamental. Edwina? Um, yeah, I would say 
you know, I think your own business starting something is incredibly exciting. I think, you know, maybe if you knew how much hard work was involved, you might think twice or three times or four times. But I guess the one thing I, I would say from experience is you have to know that you're the type of person who can switch off and sleep at night. Because I think if you are a big worrier, it's an incredibly hard path. And I think that ability to say, I'm doing my best, I'm putting it away, I'll wake up, I'll come back to it and sort it out, incredibly important. And so that would be the main question I'd ask. Sanity check. Um, I think it's okay to believe in yourself. And actually, I, I know that that sort of might sound like a statement bleeding obvious, but I don't believe that is what happens. Mm. So when we set up our business five and a half years ago, I spent the whole of the first year suffering from dreadful imposter syndrome, which was <laughs> that, you know, is it going to work? Are we going to be here in a year's time? I couldn't even say the name of the business for that, <laughs> without feeling like a total fraud. And I think that in... In many respects, it didn't oh, yeah. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I was a hell of a salesman. And, that's a, um, and, I, and I think that actually, one of the things that you find, I'm, I'm on the advisory board of a thing called Mass Challenge, which is a US incubator that's just come to London. And I went around there to meet, they, they have 90 businesses that are form, uh, being formed. And, and they're on everything from, you know, a business that sort of helps you with photography, be good for stylists, um, uh, through to gluten-free, uh, gluten-free um, sort of uh, cake makers through to the people that are building the technologies of the future. So it's a, it's a spread. But the one thing um, that you get when you're together like that is you build this sense of belief. You build this sense of esprit de corps. When you are building your own business, I mean, one of the things to pick up on, on what Edwina said is Edwina in the book talks about the power of two, is that Nick and I were lucky enough to have each other in building our businesses. Mm. So actually, what we were able to do was in those very dark moments where we didn't know, are we going to get through? How do you make it in that first five-year uh, patch? You believe in each other, yeah. but you've got to find things to believe in. That's why belief is so integral to mission. That's why it's, it's actually not okay to have a fairly anodyne view about what it is you want to do. To make it right now, you've got to really care. You've got to really believe that you want to do something that's special because that is what people want. That's what people, those are the businesses that people want to work for. Um, those are the people that people want to shop with. And ultimately, it has to start from somewhere within. You've got to find that belief. Which I think is... A fantastic way to end, thank you. And sound advice, I imagine, whatever your situation, be employee, employer, aspiring um, business owner. Um, I'm so sorry we didn't get around all of your questions today, but I really do hope you agree it has been a fantastic, inspiring and insightful session. Um, just a note to let you know that Michael and Nick will be um, outside the auditorium, I believe just through here, um, with their book, which you might like to purchase afterwards. Please. <laughs> please. <laughs> That's his condition. Um, but yeah, please do join me once again in thanking our brilliant speakers, Michael Heyman, Nick Giles and Edwina Dunn. Thank you.